those of you that have it, I believe it's on the screen. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to begin reading at verse 1. And it reads, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am based among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Y'all know Paul is slinging heavy boulders right here. Yeah. He said, look, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through yeah. God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let us yes. pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you, we honor you, we glorify you. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for every listener here, Lord God. We honor you for the opportunity to once again open the book so that you may speak to us. So open our ears and eyes of understanding. Touch our hearts, Lord God, and we will give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. Um, would, as you take your seat, would you look around at two or three people near you and say, I, I know who I am. I know who I am. Come on, you better tell them, I know who I am. better know I know why <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah have, if, have you ever had anybody that really don't know you to, to make statements about you based solely on their perception of you they just start saying stuff like they know you they act like they know who you are. They, they, they pretend they know your experiences. They know. Uh, they act like they know your background. And, and sometimes they even have the nerve to say stuff like, who do they think they are? And the majority of the time, the reason that these individuals have so much to say regarding your identity is because they themselves are unsure of who they are. They're really unsure. They're, they're, and so they try to take the, the focus off themselves and put it on you. And then they pretend that they're the experts concerning who you are and your business. They know your past, present, and future. They, well, I know, did you hear? You know, well, I really know them. And they only know what they heard about you, but they don't know the real you. Hallelujah. And they try to shift attention away from their own life. And they do it because, here it is, um, they're not doing much in their own life. And your actions shows their inactions. <laughs> because you're doing something. And they're not doing anything. Now they want to shift attention onto you. <laughs> Hallelujah. In, in other words, they, they're saying stuff like, let, let me display my false sense of superiority and expertise um, based on somebody else's life when in fact um, they have failed to produce in their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And th these people are known as distractors. They're haters. They're messy. They're troublemakers. Y'all don't know anyone like that. They are not at your job or in your family and they certainly aren't in the church. No, no, we don't know anyone like that. <laughs> they, they feel like as if your truth regarding your purpose takes away from who they are. They, they feel like that's because you're living your truth. You, you know who you are. You are confident in the areas that God has blessed you. And they feel like that somehow because you're walking in your purpose that it's taking something away from them. Hallelujah. The, 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 and, I, and this is the reason that we have this subject of I know who I am. 
I know as believers today, you have to know who you are. You, you have to know, because it is, a, it is scary that we have reached a point in our society where the world is telling the church who they are and, and who the church is supposed to be. And they don't know our book. They don't know the God that we serve. They don't understand that God has purposed us and gifted us. And, and they've tried to hurt us to the point where the church won't even yell boo at a bat, that ball game. They, they have frightened the church to the point where we don't know who we are, some of us. We're walking around tiptoeing. And as, as believers, we're supposed to follow the book. If you don't know who you are, look at the book. Read the pages of the book. Embrace the book. It will tell you who you are, how you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to speak, how you're supposed to love, how you're supposed to care and share. It's, it's, it's concerning um, when the world says, well, the church is not supposed to um, say anything that offends anybody. And my Bible tells me Jesus upset a whole lot of folks. He was unapologetic when it came to um, who the Father had called him to be. He was unapologetic. He wasn't afraid of being canceled. He wasn't afraid, you know, and I, I, even the, the world seems to be dictating who the church is and how the body of Christ is supposed to be. And they say, you know, always they say, they say that when you say what the book says, mm. that you're being judgmental. Mm. Yes. When all you're doing is saying what the book says, yes. what God has instructed us, how God is supposed, has told us to live and to love and to, and to be um, a light in dark places, how we're supposed to, they, they know about the love of God, but they don't know that, that God's love comes at a cost, that wow. Jesus paid the price for it, yeah. but the, his love, we're supposed to be obedient to him. Yeah. We're supposed to, that's what um, my Bible says, I know your Bible may say some different stuff than mine, you know, they got all these translations out there nowadays. But we're supposed to obey the book. The book determines who you are if you don't know who you are. The Bible has encouraged you to um, be um, God's representative here in the earth. And sometimes you have to be an individual that's strong enough in your faith wall, whereas you don't allow other people's opinion to deter you from walking in your purpose. We, we can't be thirsty for likes. We can't be thirsty um, to, that you, I, I gotta build up my friend list on social media. You, you can't be thirsty. Look, you gotta have to say, look, I know who I am and I was looking up this thing about being sure and confident in who you are and research suggests that people who know who they are have a consistent sense of identity. Amen. Also, they have a higher level of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, they engage in fewer dysfunctional behaviors mm -hmm. and are less likely to experience what's known as internalizing symptoms. Yeah. If you want to know what that is, internalizing symptoms are common in people with depression and other types of mental illness yeah. and, in, and can include changes in your eating habits, um, fear, loneliness, sadness, and trouble concentrating. And you're saying, well, what does all this have to do with me knowing who I am? Mm -hmm. Well, in the text that we just read, some people were trying to tell Paul who he was. They were trying to tell him what he's done. They were trying to assume some things about Paul. And Paul, in the text that we just read, said, let me clear up some stuff. Yes. Yes. Let me get some stuff straight concerning who I am. Yes. And Paul was only able to do that because he knew who he was. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. When you know who you are, yes. people can't tell you who you yes. are. That's why you got, I know who I am. I know who God has made me to be. 
Hallelujah. And Paul was not backing up. And in the chapters prior to this, Paul um, had been talking about to the church at Corinth. And he'd been talking um, concerning the, of their giving to the poor that were located in Jerusalem. And then when Paul gets to this particular chapter, after he finished dealing with the Corinthian church concerning their giving to the poor, he, start, he um, starts checking folks. I mean, he came hard and strong because rumors had built up about who Paul really was. And Paul was like, I got to straighten some stuff out. And so um, there was this group in the Corinthian church, and these were some false apostles. Paul established the church in Corinth, but after he left the church, because remember, he sees that he, he's setting up churches all over. And after he let, left the church, um, these group of false apostles came in, and they started trying to gain popularity and notoriety um, based on the church. And Paul not being there, how do, does the enemy cause disruption? When the leader's away, when those that are in authority are away, um, phony and faithful will try and come in and gain notoriety. Paul was setting some stuff straight. And so when Paul, while he's away, the word had been built up that Paul was, you know, you know, Paul, he all soft. When, when he, he, he's afraid of you to get in your face. You know, you, you start challenging, he'll back way up. But, but um, when he writes these letters to the church, Paul, it's hard. Paul is acting like he's the man in the letters. But, but, you know, when you get in his face, Paul, he ain't nobody. He, he, you just stand up to him. You know, you, you, Paul, who is Paul anyway? Paul ain't nobody. <laughs> this is what was going on in the church at Corinth. They, they were saying that Paul seemed reserved and soft in person. But, but when you talk to Paul face to face, um, he, he's a, what's that word? I ain't supposed to say it in church. They, they, they're like, he's a punk. <laughs> but, 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 but you, when you get behind that pen, you know, he's a, a pen warrior. It's like he had a cup of courage. And he'll say all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. as long as he's writing it. Yeah, yeah. But, but in person, he's not going to do anything. Yes. This was the, the context of what was going on when Paul was writing. The, they criticized Paul. They, they talked about him. And it wasn't everybody that was doing it. Right. It was the silent. There it is. Paul, it, was, it, it, was the, it was not the, the silent. It was the vocal minority. It was the vocal minority. And then not only did they have the vocal minority, they had the silent majority. Yeah. Yeah. It's a problem when you have a loud and vocal minority. Yes. And you have a silent majority. Paul wasn't the only person who had an issue with that. Um, think about Dr. King in 16, 1965 when he was discussing how many Americans did not stand up against discrimination against black people, you know, during the civil rights era. And Dr. King, he said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Yes. <laughs> Look, it sounds like what's going on here in the U.S. in politics. <laughs> the, the reason that at the church at Corinth you had the loud minority is because they had an agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Their agenda was to infiltrate, take over, and discredit Paul. Mm -hmm. That's what, what was going on. They were trying to infiltrate, discredit, and take over. And those that were in, against Paul, they had a vision of seeing themselves at, at the front. They had a vision of seeing themselves as being the head. And, you know, so they're trying to cut off the head. And so Paul, as he's writing, he's not only defending himself, Paul hopes that through this letter to the Corinthian church, 
that their perception of who he really is and their view of who God has called him to be to them will change. That they, would, they need to recognize that Paul was the apostle. He wasn't just Paul. He, he said, Paul said, um, now I'm going to come to you in gentleness now in the letter so that I don't have to come to you hard in person when I see him. Yeah. So this is what he's talking about. And so Paul, when he writes this letter, he's not flexing. He's not doing it out of pride. But Paul knew that in order for the Corinthian church to survive and be everything that they were supposed to be, that they needed to view him in a specific light. And they needed to stop listening to these special fake phony apostles because you know if you don't recognize the real you'll embrace the fake if you don't if you aren't able to recognize and so evidently they couldn't recognize they were believing these fake and phony folk and and so paul said we got to clear this up because paul realized that it was bigger than him it wasn't important that they just respect and honor Paul, they needed to honor the office. Amen. Somebody Amen. Missed it. The Amen. office held their deliverance. Amen. The office held them going to another level. The, the office helped establish the anointing. Yes. It wasn't about Paul. Paul realized that we got to get this straight because souls are at stake. Yes. So somebody's life, their very existence is at stake. And so Paul said, so that they would understand who he is. Paul, um, he was trying to stay. He was like, Paul said, listen, I didn't ask to be who I am. Right. Paul said, I, I, I was just going about my own sweet business, persecuting the saints. <laughs> I was doing all my, I was minding my own business, and Jesus came and knocked me off my beast. <laughs> he, he said, Jesus came and messed my life up. I didn't ask for this. <laughs> Look, have you ever been somewhere sitting and minding your own business? Come on, you've been you know, you're enjoying your sin. Come on. When out of nowhere, Jesus knocks you down, gets your attention in order to build you up for him. Come on. That's what was going on. Paul was in his business. Jesus knocked him down so that he could lift him up. And I know that Paul's not the only person. I know if you were like me, you, you, were, you were down, but God picked you up out of your sin. He picked you up out of your mess. He picked you up out of poverty. Come on, out of dysfunctional lifestyles, out of addiction and addictive behavior and stinking thinking. Hallelujah. Come on, you couldn't see your way clear, but God messed around and intervened and straightened some stuff out for you and in you and through you. And because of that, that's the reason you're here today. Hallelujah. Come on, anybody besides me glad, grateful, and thankful that Jesus stopped by and he, he came in and intervened in your life and on your behalf. Hallelujah. You didn't ask for him. You didn't even know you needed him. But he came anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, he gave you something new in place of the old stuff that you were doing. Come on, how many have ever, have ever stopped doing what you're doing? And look, and you're doing something new. Come on, you, you just stopped it because Jesus said a meaning. Yes, Come on, you stop talking that talk as my grandmother used to say. <laughs> you look, stop sniffing that stuff. Come on, stop taking that stuff. Stop drinking that stuff. Stop going there. Stop saying it. Stop, stop shooting up. Come on, stop doing that stuff. Hallelujah. All because Jesus came in. Then he didn't have the nerve to come in and, and gave you a new walk, a new talk, a new perspective, a new, come on, a new circle of friends. Come on, a new opportunity, a new chance, a new perspective, and even a new praise. What a praise is that? Hallelujah. What a praise is that? And not only do you not do what you used to do, you don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. There's a difference. Sometimes there, there's somebody out there that um, they don't do it because they can't do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Age, ability, and opportunity have left. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
But your testimony today is that you don't do it because you know who you are. You know who God has made you to be. That's your testimony. Come on. You, you know who the devil is and how he had tried to convert you and you said, I ain't going back there no more. Hallelujah. And, and in these verses, Paul clarifies his identity because the enemy wanted to redefine who he was. Come on, in, based on the, the naysayers. And, and, and he, the devil wants to do the same thing to some of us if we would let him. Come on. He wants you to be less than when God has made you greater than. He wants you to dishonor and disrespect and, and mishandle you so that he can do the same thing. Answer, can you back off just a little bit? Come on. He, he wants you to talk you out of being the anointed person that you are. That's what the, he wants to define you and redefine you. Hallelujah. He wants you to, to, to walk in pity. He wants you to, um, to feel low and to feel unworthy. Hallelujah. Rather than the power and the purpose that God has invested in you. Come on, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You got to know who you are. And, and when Paul is talking about him knowing who he is, he's not doing it out of arrogance. He's doing it out of confidence in the God that made him, the God that placed him, the God that blessed him. Hallelujah. And so I've got two quick points and then I'm out of your hair. But my first point is, and I end this subject of I know who I am, don't brag to them about who you are, but introduce them to who you are. Don't brag about it, but introduce. Paul, if you look at the text, he said, I Paul, not I saw, because you know there's a difference. There was Saul and then there was Paul. There is a difference. The difference is one was in the flesh. And, and, and religious, but the other was in the flesh, but it was in Christ. Come on, well, one would fight you in the flesh, but the other would fight you in the spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, one would fight you with their words, and the other would fight you with the word. Hallelujah. There's a difference between the two. Hallelujah. And Paul was saying that I know who I am because I understand where I was and where I am now. And I don't want you to get the two mixed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need you to know that I'm in a different place. I'm not the old me. You will not hold me hostage to who I used to be. You will not keep bringing up my past. That's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, yeah, you, you have this perception of me. But I know who I am based on God's word. Hallelujah. He knew who he was. Paul understood that Christ had a goal for him. Christ had a goal for his calling and for his life. And Paul said, just like Christ has a goal now for me, the devil had a goal for me in the past. Yes, he did. So before Paul had his Jesus encounter, Paul was like so many people across the country. They, he was religious. Yeah. Uh, come on, he was religious. Yeah. He knew all the rules that it takes based on religion, but he had never had a relationship with God. He said, I'm going to church, and I know every rule that there is in the church. I know the church bylaws. I have the book. I have the hymnal. So I know in, in the words to the hymn. But there was never any heart conversion. You, you can go to church all day long, but unless you come to Christ, you going to church means nothing. You got to come to Christ. Then the church, you get the real blessed meeting. Hallelujah. Paul said, I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know who I belong to. Look, and Paul was trying to tell them, kind of like he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So remember, you don't have to tell, brag about who you are. Introduce them. Paul was introducing them to himself. That's number one. Number two, you ready? Hey, look, when you know who you are, Others won't be able to tell you who you are. Amen. 
when you know who you are. So they, they, they have been treating Paul like he was just regular old anybody. It's just, oh, it's just it's Paul. It's Paul. Paul ain't nobody. Paul ain't nobody. I don't care if he, he is called by God. Paul ain't nobody. I don't care if Paul did um, change lives and he's walking in God's authority and God has his hand. Paul ain't nobody. That's what the church was saying. And, and, they, and they were trying to because these were individuals that were, had flesh and they walked in the flesh. What does that mean? They were carnal in their thinking. It's kind of like when you go to church and you don't think that you have a responsibility to love. Just lost half the folks. It's like when you go to church and you take your Bible but you never open it up. It's like when you go to church and there's a spirit of worship that people are, are, are having a God encounter and they're going in and you're like, it's like when you go to church and you can hear the same message that everybody else heard everybody else got something out of it and you didn't get a thing say nothing to me I don't see what they're so happy for could it be you in your flesh? And because they were in their flesh, they accused Paul of being in his flesh. People try and place you where they are. But they try and keep you on their level. Look, they try and say, they try and dictate your intentions because that's something that they would have done. They misrepresent what you said because they know that they use the same words to be shade and to be hurtful and to tear down. Verse 3 said, For, here it is, this is Paul talking, and he's defending himself. Look, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And what Paul was saying, yes, we all have flesh. We all have, yes, this stuff right here. We, we all have this body. We, we are all are made of flesh. Yes, we all have flesh. But, but the real here is the real you is a spirit. And as a believer, when you cater more to your flesh than you do to the spirit of God that's, that's supposed to be living on the inside of you, it's a problem. Paul catered to the spirit, but they catered to the flesh. Hallelujah. See, see, the devil, and to prove it, how the devil, he loves it when he finds fleshy Christians. He loves it. He can, look, he's like, oh, I, I got to work as hard today. You, you want to know how you can find out if you um, have a fleshy Christian in your circle? The devil will always send them to you trying to tap into your flesh because they're into their flesh. Okay, I gotta come get some of y'all. Why do you think people ask when go out for a drink? Come on, come on, come on, make it plain, make it plain now. Come on, let's go outside for a smoke. Fleshy people are driven by fleshy things. Did I say you're going to hell if you drink? No, I did not say that. I'm saying that should not be your first thing that you got to have every time when you go somewhere. It has to be involved in every social activity. It's a way of life for you. you your bar is bigger than the other bar. Amen. Fleshy people will always find you with the latest gossip. And then when God elevates you or God reaches you to a point that if I can't help you, I sure don't want to talk about you. Yeah. When you reach that level and they, they'll say, well, you used to enjoy my gossip. I knew I could depend on you whenever. If I had a good story, I knew I had a year. They want to tap into your flesh. 
They want to reach the kernel you. That's what they're trying to do. They want, they want to influence the area that they figure is the weakest part of who you are. Because the devil knows I might can mess with your flesh, but I can't mess with your spirit because that's what God has. I can't touch your spirit. Let me, let me mess with that flesh. Hallelujah. And, and they do that so that they can paint a picture of your narrative to others. They, 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 it's, it's not that they're doing it. They, they, they want to be able to say, I know them. Remember, we yeah, drink together. Yeah, yeah. And you know, everybody knows that drunk men tell no lies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 pray for pray for <laughs> When you know who you are, you'll be able to recognize when fleshy people come in your circle and they're trying to tap into areas yes. that they feel are underdeveloping. Yes. What, whatever it is, they want to tap into your flesh. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and Paul was saying, yes, I used to be that dude. Mm. Yes, I used to persecute Christians. Mm. Yes, I, I did. I went around. He said, I, I messed up royally in the past. I, I did everything you said I did, but that's not who I am anymore. He said, I had an encounter. He said, Jesus changed who I am. And what he was telling us is he was telling, he's trying to tell some of us here on today, look, don't allow other folks to tell your story because here it is, they will always leave out some important facts. So it's up to you to tell your story. It's up to you to, to look, put it within right context. Paul said, don't get it twisted and think that just because, here it is, he said, that just because folks came to church, it doesn't mean that they came to Christ. Oh, good. Good. Don't think. Because you know, I've learned that if you give people a pen, you should expect them to write your narrative. Yeah. If, you, if you give people the, the stuff, they should, you expect them to change the story to something that favors whatever they're trying to say about you. And we need to be careful when certain people say that I have your back. Oh, yeah. Come on. Because they might be having your back so that they can put a knife in it. <laughs> or here it is, they might want to have your back so that they can leave first chance of trouble hit. <laughs> you, they're gone and you still standing there. <laughs> Paul was emphasizing you know that yes, yes, uh -huh, I'm, I'm not perfect. I've got some imperfection. I've had some struggles. I had some, some issues. Amen. Hallelujah! I'm not there yet. But look, he said God's not through with me yet. He yeah. did not mean it as an excuse. Yes. Paul, he was not making up because some of us have that excuse. Mm -hmm. You know that I'm not perfect. You're judging me. So because I told you a truth that you should be living by according to Scripture, I'm judging you. Come on. It can't be out of love. It can't be out of concern. Hallelujah. Yeah. These people were trying to tarnish Paul's image. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and well, that's what's going on in our text on today. And, and if you don't know who you are, based on God's word, based on scripture, not based on society. It can't be based on culture. Because our culture is doing some special stuff. Ooh. I mean, I'm learning all kinds of stuff based on the culture that contradicts who we are supposed to be as the church. We cannot allow culture to redefine Christianity. We cannot under any circumstances, no matter how offensive it may be. Hallelujah. We cannot. Tell your neighbor, we can't do it. We cannot do it. God's word describes who we are. Yes. God's word says that, that how we're supposed to live, thrive, and be successful, how we're supposed to interact with one another, it's all in there. Hallelujah. And so, um, um, quick number, one more. Um, there is more than one way to fight. Somebody put that there, write that down. There is more than one way to fight. And, and Paul talks about, here it is, in verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. In other words, you don't just lay them down, you cast them down. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of who? Of God, and bring it into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, you better know who you are, because even if you don't know who you are, people know who you really are. Come on. Not only do you need to know who you are, but you better also know who, that others know who you are, even if they deny it. Amen. There's some people that recognize that you are gifted, that you're holy, that you're anointed, that God has his hand on you. You say, well, I don't feel it. I don't know it. But they know it. And they, they're praying that you don't recognize who, that God has a purpose for you. Paul was saying, I have flesh, but I'm not in my flesh. Paul said, I'm made of flesh and bone, but when I war, I war in the spirit. Paul was saying, look, I don't fight like you fight, but don't get it twisted and think that I don't fight. Yes. Hallelujah. That, that's what Paul was saying. Yes. Paul was saying that he was emphasizing and, and actually um, hinting that he was fighting like Jesus fought. Yes. People thought Jesus was just this humble, loving guy, because that's the only people, person that people seem to talk about. They didn't know Jesus flipped a table or two in his lifetime. Yes. But Jesus, did, Jesus, when he fought, he fought with the word of God. Come on, he did again. Those words could hit harder than any fist. Hallelujah. Why do you think that the devil can't stand people that know the word of God? Some of our issues and problems would step back and we begin to fight with the word of God and in the spirit. You, you think your cuss words mean something? Start speaking the word. Start speaking the word over your family. Speak the word over your life, over your relationships, over your mind, over your body. Hallelujah. Paul said, I fight different than you fight. Just because you don't see these fists coming at you to lay hands on you, don't mean that there won't be a, an effect from the way that I fight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Paul fought, his weapons were not made of material, but they were spiritually suited for spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. And in the, in the Corinthians church, they, as they were, some of them looked at Paul, they were looking at him from strictly a fleshy perspective. They just saw the man. That, if you do look at the way that, and I was doing a study on how Paul may have looked, they say Paul was not really that impressive in his look. Paul, Paul, Paul was, they say about yay tall, Paul did not dress fancy. Mm. Paul was he, was, he was admired for his intellect. Mm. And to look at him was not much to look at. Sounds like Jesus. Uh -huh. The way the Bible says Jesus was, a, there was nothing special about Jesus when you looked at him. He, he looked common or regular. You wouldn't notice him. He wouldn't stand out in the crowd physically, but in the spirit. But that, that's why Paul is trying to get them to understand I, I have flesh, but I war in the spirit. I'm a little man naturally, but spiritually I'm a giant and you better step off. Paul was saying, I know who I am and I need you to understand who I am so that you can be blessed. So that you can have what you need from God. So that you can grow in your faith. Hallelujah. Because if you don't know who you are, you won't be able to help those that are assigned to your life. Paul had to be who he was and had to know who he was because he knew that the church at Corinth was his responsibility. Every one of those souls needed to grow up and to thrive. And Paul said, I know who I am. Paul said, I know whose I am. Hallelujah. Paul said, I know who I am. I know whose I am. Paul said, I know who God is. I know what God says about me. I, I know, look, hallelujah. I know what God says that I'm entitled to. He said, I know what God has in store for me in the future. And, and I just came out of snowy. Look, is there anybody here today besides me? You made up your mind that since Jesus went through all the trouble to, of saving you, of blessing you, 
that you won't allow the enemy or none of his representatives to misrepresent who you are. You got to make up your mind that they're not going to misidentify you, that they're not going to mishandle you, that they won't mismanage you, that they aren't going to misjudge you, because you know who you are and you know who God has made you to be. Come on, if you recognize who you are, you better know that you walk in God's power. You walk in God's authority. You work in miracle signs and wonders. Come on, you walk in purpose. You better realize that when you know who you are, you better know that I'm the head and not the tail. Come on, I'm above only and not beneath. Hallelujah. You better recognize that the favor of God is upon you. Go tell somebody, God, favor is on my life. Come on. Come on, the favor of God is upon me. The favor of God is with me. The favor of God is around me. Hallelujah. The favor of God is in me. It works all through me. That's what Paul was saying. I know who I am. Paul was actually emphasizing even the word of God. He knew what God said about it. God is the author and the finisher of your faith. And if you, if you say, well, I just don't know who I am. Well, read the word and find out what did God say about you. God said that you were created in his own image and after his own likeness. God's word says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God's word says that you are more valuable than a sparrow. God's word says that he has given you dominion over the sheep, over the hair, over the land, and over the sea. That's what God's word says. God's word says that he has crowned you, hallelujah, with glory and honor as the pinnacle of his creation. God's word says that you have been saved by grace. God's word says that you have been justified by faith. God's word says that you are no longer in darkness, but you walk in the light of his son. God's word says that he has called you. God's word says that he has chosen you. God's word says Puts it there, the, 
chickens began to take care of it, he'd keep it warm, sit on it. Next thing you know, um, time had passed, and the chicken's eggs began to hatch, and so did the eagle egg. And so the eagle, he, um, he begins to hang out with the chickens. He, he, he starts, look, clucking and yeah. walking around the yard. He's eating worms. Remember, he's growing up in this environment. He thinks he's a chicken. So, so one day, they, they're all in the yard, and the eagle looks up, and he sees all these big, majestic birds. They're flying around. And he's, he's like, wow, they're, they're amazing. And, and they look, at, look, look at their wingspan. Look how they're, they're soaring. And he, he asked one of the chickens, he said, um, um, what are those? Because he, he, he something within him identified with what he was seeing. And his chicken buddy said, um, that's an eagle. But you need to ignore them. Because you'll never soar like they soar. You, you, you'll never be anything. You need to just get that out of your mind. But something in him was identifying with them. And so, as time passed on, he slowly continued to stay with the chickens. And one day, he died. The moral of the story. Don't let other folks tell you who you are. Because you may wind up being. You gotta know who you are. You gotta know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You gotta know that you walk in authority and purpose. If nobody else never calls you gifted, you better know that you're gifted. If nobody else calls you that they never call you wonderful, and they never say you, you gotta know who you are. You gotta know I look good no matter how big, small, black, white, short, tall, getting back, look, look, how much hair I got, how much hair I don't, I know who I am and I like who I am. Look, this is, look, this is who God made me to be, this is who God called me to be, and I'm going to walk in it. You better know who you are. Know who you are. Be who you are. Hallelujah. Bless you, Elder Quinn. I know who I am. God told me to tell somebody because the enemy is, is sending voices. Voices to you trying to throw you off. And depending on what space you're in, you might be weak enough to listen on that day. The, the Bible tells us that no voice is without significance. So just like God is whispering and trying to lead you, so is the devil. He's trying to be that voice to prevent you from soaring. He wants you to die on the ground. I want you to be less than when God has made you greater than. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a hand and praise. Come on, give God a hand and praise.